Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, which is of course Punjabi for Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the easier ones this week. Over the next few days and over the last few days, James and I have of course been reading you our favourite Christmas passages from the best books of World War Two. And we've been we've been to every theatre imaginable and Sicily quite a lot. <laughs> well, <only> once. <laughs> well, twice. <laughs> Straits of Messina. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, fair point. Okay. Fair point. Right. Yeah, so what, you can see what's top of my mind at the moment. Yeah, of course. What have you got for us today? Well, okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to Sicily. Uh, I'm going to Normandy instead. All right, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Northwest Europe. So this is Bert Starr's <laughs> Serenade to the Big Bird, and it's, a, it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful memoir. And it, it was written pretty much at the time. It was written in 1944. Right. He dies in November 1944. He gets out of... He, he's one of these very unusual people that starts as a, as a, a, in a bomber crew and then becomes a fighter pilot. Right. Uh, and weirdly, he gets killed in a Mustang... Um, in November 1944, which by that stage of the war is, you know... Quite... Div- well, not, it's unusual. Well, you, you know, it's, Less still, it's still incredibly dangerous. Less probable. But you're much more likely to come a cropper in a B-17 than yeah. you are a, a, a Mustang. Let's put it that way. But the book is really good and, it, and it's really sort of... Um, it ruminates a lot. It, it's, it's a bit wacky at times. Um, but again, there's just some very, very moving and profoundly thoughtful passages in it of a young yeah. man who's trying to make sense of absolute mayhem. We went on our first one on the 19th of April. We had a practice mission the afternoon before, the first time we'd flown in a month, and we weren't bad, so the colonel said we could go. Some major gave us a little talk about how we might as well start sometime, and were there any questions, and just fly that baby in close, and you'll come home every time. The squadron was short on crews, or we would have had some more practice missions. After the major let us go, Sam got the crew over in the corner, and told us we'd have to be on the ball from here on in. And you've got to fly in close, he told me. I'm not going to do all the work. He had slept most of the way across the Atlantic, but now he was feeling serious. I'd only flown formation in a 17 twice, once in the phases and once on the practice mission. I wasn't very hot. This is the big league now, Sam said. Everybody said so. We'd been in the bomb group for four days, and everyone in the group knew he was in the big league. After Sam let the crew go, I asked him, Are you scared? I'm Sam, he said. He was all right. He was ready to go. We went over to the club then. It didn't seem any different. Nobody seemed to care that there was an alert on and a raid tomorrow. Nobody went off in the corner to brood. We had pork chops for dinner, and I sat next to a guy in our squadron named La something. I called him La French because I could never remember the last part. He was big and acted half drunk most of the time, and he looked like a pirate. So, you've joined our noble band, he said. We'll probably go tomorrow, I said. A joyride, he said. Lucky boy. Where to? What does it matter? He waved his hands. The Luftwaffe has beat. Haven't you heard? That was fine with me. I wanted to see a Fokker Wolf sometime, but I didn't care about seeing one tomorrow. After chow, La French and I went out to say goodnight to his airplane. The dispersal area is way down past the skeet range and a turnip field. We took our bikes and rode for a world of blue and green and soft through the haze. We saw the plane was chocked in good for the night, and then hung around waiting for the sun to go down. Sort of pretty, the French said. I thought he was talking to himself, so I didn't say anything. I was well established in the sack when a bunch of guys came into the room and turned the lights on. A bombardier and a navigator were putting their co-pilot to bed, but he'd broken away into my room. He was pretty drunk and he really had the bright stare of death in his eyes. So you made the team, this co-pilot said. I guess so. I was about half asleep. All he did was laugh, just stand there and laugh, until the whole room was full of it and shaking from it. The bombardier and navigator got him under control, then took him away to bed. The bombardier came back after they put him away. That baby's got it bad, he said. He won't last much longer. He's seen too many guys go down. When the lights were out again, I lay there for a while, not ready to go to sleep. I wasn't scared. I was just wondering what I was doing here at all. I'd been building up to that night for a long time. I used to dream about it at school, sitting there drinking Cokes with some girl, reading about airplane magazines. I used to think about it all the time in the cadets. And now we were really here, ready to go to war in the morning. We were going to knock off the Germans. I knew right then that I didn't know much about killing. I didn't feel like the Polish Spitfire pilots we met in Iceland. They had it bad. They wanted to kill every German in the world. But it was different with me. 
I'd never been shot at or bombed. My folks lived on York Street in Denver, which is a long way from this war. All I knew about war I got through books and movies and magazine articles and listening to a few big wheels who came through the cadet schools to give us a lowdown. It wasn't in my blood. It was all in my mind. The whole idea was to blow up just as much Germany tomorrow as possible, from way up high. It wouldn't mean a thing to me. I wouldn't know if any women or little kids got in the way. I thought about it before, but that night it was close. The more I thought about it, the uglier it seemed. What I wanted to do tomorrow was ski down Baldy up at Sun Valley or wade out into the surf at Santa Monica and get all knocked out in the waves and come in and lie in the sun all afternoon. Instead, I was going on a trip, a long trip, to help some other guys beat up a town or an oil plant or a steel mill. It seemed like a pretty futile way to live. Then I thought a while about the eight guys who had slept in my bed in the last four months. They were all dead, or down in some German stalag, or getting drunk in Sweden, or hiding in some French ditch somewhere. They hadn't hurt the bed much. It was a nice sack, the only good one in England up to then. Some joker dragged me out of it at two in the morning. Come on, he said. Breakfast at 2.30, breathing at 3.30. It was Lieutenant Parada. Somebody upstairs who wasn't on the list was shouting, Drag the lift whopper up and give him a blow for me. I walked over to the mess hall through the dark. Before missions, we used to eat at the big dog's mess hall, number one, with the colonels and the majors, and the ground grippers, like weathermen and intelligence. The briefing was in a big, overgrown Nissen hut. Some major got up first and told us we were going down south to Kassel, to a place called Eschwege, where the Germans had a fighter park, a sort of shipping point and comfort station for ships clearing to the forward bases. They showed us where it was on a big wall map, and how it looked to the reco cameras the last time they were over there. The weatherman showed us where the clouds would be, and the guy in charge of traffic told us how to taxi out. The formation was all drawn up on the blackboard, and I copied down all the ship numbers and where they flew. We were flying right wing off the lead ship of the high squadron. The navigators went somewhere else for some more briefing. Sam went off to change his pants, and I queued up in the co-pilot's line for kits. The gunners were somewhere else getting the same thing. There wasn't room for them in our briefing hut. Standing there in line, I could tell this was going to be the bad time. We were supposed to have a record escort 47s and 51s all over, all the way. But we were going in deep, and the Germans didn't want us over there at all. The equipment hut was a mess with everyone trying to dress in the same place at the same time. I decided to wear an electric suit because I hate long johns. I put on my ODs over that, and a summer flying suit over that, and a leather jacket on top. A May West comes last. I was sweating before I got into all my clothes, and by the time I had heaved my flak suit and parachute on the track, I could feel the sweat rolling down my knees and pooling up in my insteps. The rest of the crew were still struggling in the equipment room, so Crone and I lay down among the parachutes and looked at the stars. It was time to think again. I said hello to Lady Luck up there somewhere in the blue. As long as she went along too, I knew I'd be all right. I told her where we were going, but I think she already knew. The others came out in time, and the truck took us out to the plane. Everybody was talking fast and laughing, and I felt sort of ready, like I'd been waiting for a long time for this to happen. Lewis was trying to put his guns in the turret, while I tried to stow my flak suit under the seat where I could reach it fast. "'God damn it,' I said. "'There ought to be more room in these goddamn things.' "'Take it easy,' he said. I couldn't find my helmet, and one of my gloves was missing. Bird and Benson were all tangled up in the nose getting their guns in. Sam was the only smart one. He stayed outside talking to the crew chief until everyone else got set. We were flying somebody else's plane, the Keystone Mama. I turned my flashlight on the brown lady with no brassiere, painted on the side, and decided they were short of artists at this base. Spau and I went up to look at the bombs, and I tore the whole back end out of my flying suit crawling through the bomb bay. We were hauling ten five hundreds, big and blunt-nosed, and ugly things. I patted one a couple of times, and it felt cold and dead. When all the guns were in, we huddled up back by the tail. It was sort of like the locker room in high school before a ball game, only not so tense. Crone said, I hope those bastards come in on my side. Sharp said, I hope they all stay in the sack. Beach didn't have anything to say at all. He was a sleepy guy and older than the rest of us. For a minute he seemed closer, just because he came from Denver, and we were so far from there. I passed out the candy bars and the gum and the kits, and Sam cleared his throat. OK, he said. This is our first one. We might as well make it good. Everyone looked all right, just a little tense and tired of stalling around. We started our engines at six o'clock. They kicked over right on down the line. Start one, mesh one, start two, mesh two. Good engines. There was plenty of daylight when we got to the takeoff position. 
There were forts stacked up there for blocks. They didn't look very eager, just sitting there on their tail wheels. There were a lot of new silver ones, but the majority still had the dirty old brown-green paint on, like the Keystone Mama. Then we moved out on the runway, everything set, and got the green light. I watched the instruments and called off the airspeed, and Sam herded her down the runway. We were bouncing all over before the needle hit 120. Then Sam pulled her off, and we were airborne. Grant gave me the heading over the interphone, and we started climbing on course away from the blood-coloured dawn. Sam and I decided to trade off every 50 minutes until we got used to going to war, but he flew most of the assembly, and I just changed the RPM when he called for it and sweated. I thought the 18 planes would never get together. We just flew around and around, getting nowhere, and then miraculously, we were all in, flying off the right leaders. We formed at 17,000, and my oxygen mask was bothering me, and my hair was soupy with sweat, and I couldn't move my shoulders in my electric suit. It was too late to do anything about it, though. Our group got lined up in the wing formation, but someone was off somewhere, or some other wings were way out of line, because just as I was about to sit back and look around, we went driving through into another wing on a collision course. For a few seconds, there were airplanes everywhere, and we were flopping around in the prop wash. Sam was screaming inside his oxygen mask, and then they were gone. I hadn't even stopped breathing hard before it happened again. Bird yelled over the interphone, Here they come! I ducked, and he said, I don't want to die this way. Nobody got it head on, but nobody missed very far. The air looked clear then, so Sam let me take it a while. I held it in for a while and then started thinking about something or other. And when I came to, we were way back out of formation. Sam grabbed the frontals, and I could hear him swearing into his oxygen mask. Get on the ball, he said a minute later. You've got to stay in there. Somewhere down in the formation, the lead navigator was sweating out his checkpoints, and the various squadron leaders were sweating out, keeping their boys out of the prop wash and in the right position, and all we had to do was hang on to that wing. But that was plenty. I was hot, and my oxygen mask was trying to gag me, and I over-controlled the throttles too much, then too little, trying to fly that big bird so close. Sam could sit there and move the throttles a quarter of an inch once in a while and keep us in tight, unless he got careless. But I just didn't have the touch. I made labour out of it. I heaved that big lady all over the sky, jockeying for position, eating up gas. We flew across the channel and cut in at the Dutch coast. The navigator was on the ball, and we didn't see any flak until we were out of the Zyde Z. Some other wing navigator was asleep, and they caught it right in the middle of the formation. Nobody went down, pretty black puffs in a blue sky. Harmless looking stuff. We were flying into the sun, and our top window was so dirty I couldn't see out of it at all. The front sheet of bulletproof wasn't any too clean, and it was rough trying to see anything into the sun. Bird called for the oxygen check every ten minutes. We were numbered off from the tail. One OK, two OK, and so on, up through ten in the nose. We sounded like a hot outfit. Fighters, three o'clock high, came over the interphone. They looked like 47s, Bird said from the nose. They were 47s and they hustled on by into the sun. "'We're over the Third Reich,' Benson announced. The land was all chopped up into little fields and little towns. The fields were just as green as England, greener than Illinois when we crossed it last. They used the same sun down there, and the same moon. The sky was just as blue to them as to anyone at home, probably. But for some reason, the people down there were Nazis. Sam signalled me to take the throttles for a while. The wing on our left was swinging in front of us, and it threw a wrench in the collective works. Everyone started chopping throttles back. I overran the lead and stayed throttles clear back too long. When I hit the power again, we were faded. I looked up into the sun and knew right then we were meat for this Luftwaffe. I could feel them up there waiting for a chance like this. I jacked up the RPM and poured on the gas and we moved back in slowly. There were forts everywhere, grouped into wings, winged into air divisions. The whole works was the 8th. Jimmy Doolittle's Air Force. Sharp called us some flack at seven o'clock. Look at that stuff, he yelled. It's all over hell. Take it easy on the interphone, Sam yelled at him. Maybe our wing was off. Maybe everyone was a little off. Anyway, wings started swinging in for their targets in front of us, behind us, and a couple of them tried to go through our formation while we were lining up our bomb run. I didn't have any idea we were near the target until I saw the lead ship's bomb bay swing open. Benson said, We're at the IP. Why didn't you tell me? Bird said excitedly. I thought we'd probably get left with a bomb load, but it turned out we had plenty of time for Bird to get ready to operate. I crouched down, waiting for the flak to start. By all the rules, there was supposed to be flak around us, right in our laps. The bombs fell out of the lead ship, and Bird yelled, "Ours were gone!" Radio man, see if all the bombs went. Sam said, "Wahoo!" Somebody yelled from the back end. Look at that smoke! Everyone was talking at once. We had the RPM jacked up, swinging off the target. Still no flak. 
We missed it all to hell, Bird said. I couldn't even see the target. All he had to do was toggle the bombs out when the leader let go. Soft life. Everyone was letting down a thousand feet so we could get out of the country a little sooner. A couple of wings off to the left were catching some flak, and somebody had wiped out most of a town down to our right. We seemed to be out on the edge of the show. We're in France now, Benson called up. We're out of their goddamn country. I couldn't tell the difference. From that high, I couldn't see that the people were all good guys. I did see a barn where I could hide if we had to bail out. Maybe there was a hayloft where some dark-eyed French girl was waiting with a couple of jugs of wine. Maybe there was a stormtrooper with big boots and a bayonet to comb through the hay. I decided to stay up high as long as possible. There were quite a few airplanes in sight when we came in, but on the way out we saw thousands. Every direction, up or down or sideways, there were airplanes, big birds and little friends. There was one beat-up old B-24 struggling along down low, with a couple of P-38s hanging around for company. "'We're over Belgium,' Benson called up after a while. "'That big town is Brussels.' It looked peaceful down there. Then I remembered my flak suit stowed under the seat. It was a little late, but I put it on. Sam had climbed into his, way back over the channel, coming in. It was heavy on my neck. I flew for a while until my neck began to bend in. My neck began to ache and my shoulder was sending in sympathy pains from time to time. Then I decided it wasn't worth it and dumped the thing down in the catwalk. Two fifty-ones came jazzing by, looking for game. I traded with Sam for a while and he went on the interphone. There was nothing but shrieks with static. Then I heard this guy call into the wing leader. I'm going down, our oxygen's gone. Can you get us some escort? He was breathing like a horse. My navigator's shot to hell. I've got to go down. There was terror in his voice. Up there, somewhere in that soft blue sky, a navigator was dying. It was pretty hard to believe. The coast came in sight. Sometimes Crone or Sharp would call off flat to the left or right, but we didn't even come close. There were three straggling 17s down with the Liberators by then, but the fighters were herding them home. There's a war on down there, Sharp said as we crossed the coast. Look at all the blood. He couldn't believe it, and neither could I, but somewhere down there in that crazy patchwork of farms and towns and beaches, there were some hard-eyed jokers who would have liked to get at us. Sam was back on VHF. Somebody's dying, he said to me. Some navigator. This guy keeps calling up that his navigator is dying. What the hell good does that do? We started letting down, and we crossed the coast. The formation began to loosen up a little. We'd heard a lot of stories about the old days. Eight months ago, when the Abbeville kids were waiting at the coast for loose formations, there was a puddle of drool in my oxygen mask. I rubbed my face, but it felt like a piece of fish. The candy bar tasted wonderful. When we hit the English coast, I was flying. Tighten up a little, Sam said. They said, tighten it up. He waved me in closer. That navigator is still dying, he said thoughtfully. That guy keeps calling in. We were supposed to look sharp when we flew over some field at the coast, because Doolittle and Spats were down there watching, and maybe Mr. Stetness and Mr. Churchill were along as guests. I don't know how we looked. I know I didn't care much. I'd never been so tired. The navigator found the way home, and we circled the field while the low squadron peeled off. I put the wheels down, and Sam came in high and plunked us in halfway down the runway. We've been to the war, Sharp said. We're back now, Bird said back on that big wide runway. We put the Keystone Mama back where we got her and threw all the stuff out of the ground. Wonder if we killed anyone, Lewis said. Wonder if we hit the fighter park, Sam said. I was so shot I didn't want to move. My flying had been lousy. My hair was spongy with sweat. And my eyes felt like they'd been sanded down and wrapped in a dry sack. While I sat there, a plane taxied by with half its tail blown off. It was one of ours. I didn't believe it. Lewis got out his guns and I carried one of them over and put it on the truck for him. Sharp said, well, we're not virgins any more. I still feel like one, Crone said. I didn't see nothing. We'd been there, and we were home. I lay back in a pile of flak suits and closed my eyes. There weren't any holes in us. Our tail wasn't blown off. Right then, I didn't want to be anywhere else in the world, and these were the people I wanted to be with, these guys on this crew. The equipment hut was jammed with guys, and it smelled like a stable. How was it? somebody said. I turned around, and there was a chaplain, the Catholic one. Milk run, I said. A joy ride. He smiled at me. He knew I was new. Then the smile went away. They got two, he said. Two whole crews are gone. He moved on to the next guy, but I heard someone else say they were out of the high composite. We had put up part of another group, and those guys are in the other one. They made a 360 at the target, somebody said, and the 109s are up there in the clouds. Nobody saw the fighters. They came out of the sun, and they only made one pass. One fort blew up, and one went down burning. La French was one of them and the drunk co-pilot that woke me up in the night before was the other. That poor bastard could see it coming, somebody said. He knew it was his turn. They were talking about that co-pilot, but Le French wasn't like that. 
He was still alive the last time I saw him. He rode that bike of his like it was sea biscuit. And now he was just blood and little chunks of bones and meat, blown all over the sky, or he was cooked, burned into nothing. I thought about him all through the interrogation. I drank three cups of coffee, but I couldn't get him out of my mind. A G.I. brought around a shot of scotch for each man on the crew. Lewis was sick, and Beach was too tired, and Spow didn't want any. I don't like this goddamn English scotch, Crone said. It don't taste like American scotch. I'm not in the mood, Bird pushed his away. In the end, I had a tall glass, full of scotch, and part of another one. I knew what was going to happen, but I drank it and chased it with coffee. The room got warm, and the sunlight turned deep gold. La French was gone, but it was no good thinking about him any more. I was there, and I was alive. Billy Barron came along on his bike, and I went outside. It's early, he said. Let's go for a ride. I didn't know him very well. He lived in the room across the hall, and he was always smiling. We went down a road until it turned, and then we went the other way. There was a church with old grey walls and houses with thatched roofs, and some little kids pulling a wagon full of milk bottles and a muddy pond with dirty ducks in it. There isn't any way to tell how good it was to be there, just to be moving, just to be riding down a road on a bicycle, and breathing and laughing once in a while, not knowing where the road led to, and not caring. The world was endlessly big, and so green and soft, and endlessly green. We didn't come back until late. So how do you end up flying fighters if you've been in bombers? What, what, what Did he volunteer? Yeah, he did. He, it was something that he wanted to do to start off with and then right. got put into bombers. And, and so he finished his tour and then he, and then he managed to get transferred. <sighs> but, he's, he, but he's interesting. You know, he'd started off as a kind of sort of, you know, a sort of college journalist right. at, at university. And what I love about it is, is the immediacy of it. You know, it was written, you know, at the time. Yeah, it's yeah. written in 1944. It's obviously based on his diary. It's obviously, in, you know, there's an awful lot of boredom involved, even if you're on a sort of bomber crew. I mean, there's big passages when you're not flying and yeah. just kicking around. And obviously he's sitting in his room kind of filling out notebooks and stuff. And that's the basis of it. So a lot of them are just random thoughts that comes into his head yeah. and a particular time and he jots them down. But they're very human. I mean, you, I can see myself, if I've been in that situation, having very, very similar thoughts. Yeah. So it really sort of strikes a chord. Yeah. I think it's terrific. Yeah. I mean, he's rightly fated yeah. as as, as one of the sort of the great American um, uh, um, air war memoirs, memoirs right. and, you know, and deservedly so. Well, thanks very much. Merry Christmas, everyone. Cheerio.